Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we're based here in the UK, all times are in BST. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 7th to the 13th of April. I'm Features Editor Ezzy Pearson, and I'm joined this week by astronomy writer Mary McIntyre. Hello, Mary. Hi, Ezzy. It's great to be back. It's great to have you back. And what do we have to look forward to in this week's night sky? Well, this week, we've got some more shadow transits on Jupiter. We have a pink micro moon, several lunar conjunctions and clear obscure effects, and Flora fancies a hamburger. As always, both you and Katrin have a a wonderful way of absolutely confusing me. So I look forward (laughs) to find out what Flora is getting up to. But shall we get going with what we have to see this week? So I'm going to start with the planets. So Uranus is still visible in Taurus, hasn't moved very much since last week, still similar magnitude at mag plus 5.8, near the boundary of Aries, and it's setting at about 11.15 p.m. You will need binoculars or a telescope to spot that. Or actually, you can take a photograph of it with a mobile phone camera. You can go into your camera settings and actually get it to do a slightly longer exposure picture. That's enough to actually capture a little dot that will be Uranus. So it's really cool that you can do that with easy technology these days. Camera on phones have just improved so much. It's just made astrophotography available to everybody now. Some phones, you do need to have a third party app to let you adjust things like shutter speed and exposure times and things like that but there are quite a lot of those available for free or not much money so investigate that before you're going out to go and take a picture of uranus yeah and get used to where all the app settings are as well yes. I've, I've fallen foul of that before now. wise when you're doing <laughs> any kind of photography make sure you know where all the buttons are before you actually get to the place where you want to take the picture absolutely <laughs> A bit easier to spot is Jupiter, which still lies in Taurus. That is setting around 1.10 a.m., so a good amount of time to spot that after dark. That's blazing at mag minus 2.1, so you'll easily be able to spot that. This week, Jupiter's actually going to pass within 1.2 degrees of the open cluster NGC 1746, so that'll look pretty. I quite like it when a planet joins a cluster. I remember a few years ago when Venus joined the Pleiades, it was like one of the best nights ever. So it's always cool, again, just as we always talk about that solar system mechanics, everything's moving at a different speed. So it's really cool when a planet moves through a star cluster of some kind. On Wednesday, the 9th of April, between 7.40pm and 10 15 p.m we've got a ganymede shadow transit that actually begins in daylight so that will be more of a challenge but as it gets dark you'll be able to spot the shadow part way across the disc and then see it go all the way across and leave again and on sunday the 13th of april at 9 5 p.m you can start seeing an io shadow transit and that continues through till 11 20 p.m While that's going on, you've got Io itself on Jupiter's disk and that will leave the disk at 10.15 p.m. If you have a big telescope, you may be able to just see where the moon itself is, but that's really quite an advanced thing. But what you will be able to see if you are seeing the shadow transit is the moon suddenly appear as it leaves Jupiter's disk. So quite a lot of moon stuff going on again this week on Jupiter. Mars is in Gemini this week, and that is about 58 degrees above the southwest after sunset, setting around 4 a.m. Although it is still fading and shrinking, it's still mag plus 0.4, so it's very easy to spot. It's it's brighter than quite a lot of the stars in our sky, and it has that reddish colour to it, so you will be able to see that in Gemini. Venus was at inferior conjunction last month, so it's now in the dawn sky. It still lies in Pisces as it did last week. It's rising even sooner before the sun now. You've got about 80 minutes of Jupiter rising before the sun rises. So it will be kind of lost in the dawn twilight, but you should be able to spot it because it is now rising quite a while before the sun does. Yeah, it's very bright, but so is the sky. So it's still worth trying to get out there and see it, especially if you're up and about at that time of the morning anyway. But just be aware, it might not appear as bright as you think it should. No. <laughs> For a, what was it, minus 4.6. 
it, which it was like last month. It's definitely not that, but yeah, it, it, well, it technically is, but it visually will not be that. <laughs> but it's still worth seeking out. Mercury, Saturn and Neptune are very close together in Pisces, but they're all too close to the sun to observe this week. Minor planet Vesta is still continuing its trip through Libra and is heading towards opposition on the 2nd of May, rises at 10.30pm and is then visible all night long. At Mag plus 5.8, you will need binoculars or a telescope to see it or again, take a photograph and it should show up if you know where you're looking. Midweek, it's now moved 4.3 degrees above Zubaneshamali, so it's moving slowly further away from that star in Libra. But continuing its journey so it's fun to watch that now this event i'm really excited about minor planet flora was at opposition on the 12th of march it's now faded to mag plus 10.1 but it's still observable with a small telescope on wednesday the 9th of april it's going to be within 0.008 degrees of a mag plus 9.8 star in leo so that's an Mm. insanely close conjunction that's virtually nothing at all Exactly. I mean, with small binoculars, they're probably going to look like they're occulting each other. But if you've got a lot more magnification, you will be able to resolve the two. Not quite enough to occult it, which does sometimes happen. Sometimes asteroids do. But the really exciting thing is between Thursday the 10th and Sunday the 13th of April, Flora is going to pass literally in front of the Hamburger Galaxy. So this galaxy is one of the Leo triplet and it's a side on spiral galaxy and it kind of has like a dark dust lane so it looks a bit like a hamburger sandwich hence its name so the galaxy is mag plus 10.4 as well and if you observe it over those days you will see what looks like a star kind of moving position and it kind of passes directly in front of the galaxy itself just underneath the dark lane so i don't think i have ever observed a minor planet just genuinely moving in front of a galaxy before so i think this is awesome so it'll be really cool to just take a photo each night and then just plot like an animation of it moving across the hamburger galaxy that galaxy does need a transparent sky you can technically spot it with binoculars but it's quite a challenge but with a telescope it should definitely be within reach and smart telescopes if you just get your smart telescope to a line on the hamburger galaxy you will be able to plot the movement of flora through the field of view so that's really exciting i i'm looking forward to that event i think that will be quite an amazing thing to see and as you said good for if people are taking photos we always love to see your photos please do send them in we've got the details down in the show notes below or you can find more details at sky at night magazine.com so i'm going to finish up with some moon stuff because there's quite a lot going on with the moon we're moving from a waxing gibbous through to a full moon on thursday the 13th of april so on tuesday the 8th of april the gibbous moon is going to lie just 4.2 degrees to the left of regulus as you're looking at it Also on Tuesday, the 8th of April, we have the jeweled handle, which is always beautiful. I never get tired of looking at that as the sun rises over sinus iridum and just Mm. catches all of the high sections around the edge of the bay. It's just so pretty. They call it the jeweled handle for a reason. Yeah, it's just gorgeous. It really is. And it's kind of nice. Also, recently, I saw a photograph of the sun setting over that region and just how different it looks with the sun setting versus rising. Mm -hmm. Because the bits that are highlighted when it's rising are in shadow when it's setting. And it was really awesome to see the comparison. But the jeweled handle is really easy to spot with binoculars or a small telescope. So definitely look for that. And also connected to sinus iridum the following day when the sun has risen over that area, look for Cassini's moon maiden. If you're looking in a refractor, it'll be the right way up for it to look like (laughs) the side profile of a lady with long flowing hair, which was named after Cassini's wife. So this is Promotorium Heraclides area. And once the sun illuminates that area, it does give that impression She will be upside down if you're looking with binoculars. But it's one of those clear obscure effects that people have photographed many times and not realised it. And I love Cassini's moon map where he literally drew a woman on it. It didn't even try to make it look like it was actual topographical feature. He literally just drew a woman's face, which I think is beautiful. (laughs) On the 10th of April... There's another clairobscure effect visible at 1am and that is Mons Herodotus. And as the sun starts to rise over that area, we get the clairobscure effect called the star-tipped mountain. 
this is like an isolated mountain in an area of complete shadow. And as the sun rises, it just catches the tip of that mountain. So it's called the Star Tip Mountain because it gives you this really bright kind of dot in the middle of the shadowy areas. So you will need a telescope to see that, but it's kind of similar to the stars of Aristillus that we talked about last week, but this is an isolated peak this time. And that area around Aristarchus and Herodotus is always beautiful to observe anyway, so definitely look for that. I do think that Claire Obscure gets some of the best names when it comes to stuff in the night sky. It's like the star-tipped mountain, the jeweled handle, the moon maiden. They're all so incredibly poetic. They really are. Less so with like the Luna X and V, but <laughs> they can't all be winners, I suppose. <laughs> Yeah, that basically does what it says on the can, but I do like the more poetic names of them. On Friday the 11th of April, the almost full moon lies 4.6 degrees below Porima, and then on Sunday the 13th we have a full moon. The full moon is going to be just one degree away from Spica, and the April's full moon was in the Native American almanac of North America, was historically called the pink moon because it coincided with the blossoming of the pink phlox wildflowers that grow in that part of America. So we still use those names quite a lot, and I quite like those names. We've talked about this before, but it's a real part of history. That's how they march the passage of time. It's not woo-woo. It's just the name it was used to be known by before we had calendars to keep us on track. So I quite like that, even though we don't have pink phlox wildflowers here in the UK, I still think the pink moon's a, a nice name. But this full moon coincides with apogee moon when it is at its most distant. So this is sometimes referred to as a micro moon. So basically, there's no official definition of when a moon is a micro moon, but generally the consensus is when it's further away than 405,000 kilometres compared to perigee moon, which is closer than 360,000 kilometres. So there is a bit of a difference in distance there because the moon's orbit is not perfectly circular. So the apogee moon, when you're observing it, is about 14.1% smaller and about 30% dimmer. But with the naked eye, that is a change that is just imperceptible. Like There's no way that you'll be able to spot that. If you have a telescope and take a picture of a perigee and an apogee and put them side by side, you will see a difference in size. To the naked eye, something that is only half a degree of sky, you are not going to see a 14% difference in size. So definitely do go out and watch the full moon rising because it always looks amazing. But interestingly, the perigee and apogee moons do have an impact on tides. And because this is a micro moon, it will lead to spring tides that are about two inches less in height than you would get mm. during a, a perigee moon. So it does impact the tides a little bit. Visually, makes no difference to us whatsoever. The moon is always beautiful to watch when it's rising. So yeah, definitely it's... do go out. And it, the reason it looks huge when it's rising is something called the moon illusion. And it's because your brain is kind of knows that that distant tree is a big thing and you see the moon next to it and your brain's going, oh, wow, it looks massive. The moon is the same size when it's rising as it is when it's at its highest point in the sky, but it just looks bigger when it's near the horizon. It's also one of the reasons why it's so hard to see this difference in size, because when they're side by side, you've got something to compare it to. But when it's up in the middle of the sky, it's really hard for us humans to judge things size if we don't have something to compare it to. And that's why our brain does all kinds of weird tricks when it's next to something like a tree, which appears to be just about as far away, but isn't. <laughs> and, and so all of these things. Last year, I actually went to the top of the hill behind our village and photographed the moon rising over some trees that are three miles away. So my zoom lens was pointing at that so you could see bits of mm. farmland and trees and the moon was rising. It looked massive in the sky. At the same time, I took a photograph with my phone to show this tiny dot in the distance. <laughs> <laughs> The comparison between the two is just wild because they're both taken at the same time. But that trick of perspective, because the trees were three miles away that the moon was rising behind, you end up with this thing that looks really big. And it's really actually quite fun to do that. One thing I will clarify, this is the pink moon. That doesn't necessarily mean it will actually appear to be pink. It's just what it's called. I say that because last month it was a lunar eclipse where it did kind of look pink. So... <laughs> Sometimes when the moon's rising, if the atmosphere is right and all the conditions are correct, it can look a bit orange, it can look a bit pinky, but that's not guaranteed to happen. So just don't don't go expecting to actually see a pink moon. 
No, I did actually did take a photograph of a rising strawberry moon once and it was bright pink and everyone was like, oh, it's called the strawberry moon because it's pink. I was like, no, that was just the yeah. lucky atmospherics that day. I'd spent all day telling people the moon will not look like a strawberry. Then it did rise looking like a strawberry. <laughs> it's, it's this time of year when it's like, I think it is slightly more likely for atmospheric conditions to be right. I sort of always associate those kinds of the moon rises with sort of spring and autumn at least but not guaranteed and that's not what it's named after either. No, but when the moon's rising at this time of year as well, especially when you're getting close to full moon, it quite often is rising on the side of the sky where you get the belt of Venus effect happening, Yes, which is where you get that lovely pinky orange glow along the horizon and then you get the shadow of the earth slowly creeping up, enveloping it. And when you've got a moon that's close to full rising into the belt of Venus, it looks absolutely gorgeous. So that is just atmospheric impact there that's making the blue light get preferentially scattered away. And it's just got that beautiful pinkish glow. Usually the more colourful that is, the worse the scene conditions are for that night for imaging. <laughs> but it does look gorgeous when the sun's setting. Well, it certainly sounds like there's lots of great things to look forward to in this next night sky. If our listeners want even more stargazing highlights, please subscribe because we'll be back here next week. But to summarise this week again, we start on Tuesday the 8th of April when the moon lies 4.2 degrees from Regulus and also look for the jeweled handle on the moon. On Wednesday the 9th from 7.40pm, there's a Ganymede shadow transit across Jupiter and also look for Cassini's moon maiden. On Thursday the 10th, at 1am, the star-tipped mountain is visible as the sun rises over Mons Herodotus on the moon. On Friday the 11th of April, the moon lies 4.6 degrees below the star Porima. On Sunday the 13th of April, the pink micromoon lies 1 degree from Spica. And finally, make sure you're observing the Hamburger Galaxy from Thursday to Sunday to observe the Flora asteroid passing across it. From all of us here at Star Diary, goodbye. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Thank you.